Yes. Has it started? Has it started? Has it started? Has it started? Yes, it has. Or it says it's starting. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Matt, can you hear me? Uh, Matt's going, are you going live? Yes, I am live. What's up, Brazil? What's wrong with A? Uh, um, hello, everyone. Tis Bonus. Hey, LB. David. Tony. Adam. Mark. Joe. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Good morning. Yes, AJ. Hello. Hello, Diego. Hello, Will. I'm trying to get everybody's names as it goes by. James. Frame Junkie. Tom. I am here. So you can go on. Thank you, Delta. <laughs> Send Sweaty. Eddie. AJ again. Loud and clear. Fantastic. We hear you in Canada, in Canada. Nothing wrong with ASIO. Don't know what that means. I'm, I think you're having a conversation without me, so it's quite all right. I, I don't know what that is um, about. Good morning. Hello, live, live. Hi from New Jersey. Um, early afternoon in New Jersey. Hello in Pakistan. Hello in Ireland, Mr. O'Rourke. Cornlandia. <laughs> Are you in Cornwall? Costa Rica. Has everyone been watching... Um, Hello in the Netherlands. Has everybody been watching uh, the World Cup? It's weird to have a World Cup without the Netherlands and um, Italy. It just doesn't feel right. And then to see so many teams be average and then think to yourself, well, if Italy had been in and, and uh, if Italy had been in and, and uh, the Netherlands had been in, they would have put up a severe fight. You remember when uh, the Netherlands played Spain in the last World Cup and beat them 5-0? You know, um, it's really crazy not to have them in. The way the groups work in the qualifying is very strange. Anyway, it's uh, hello in Mexico. Congratulations on your win. Oh, oh, Waves Gold is on sale for 129. Dang. That's pretty amazing. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Apparently, um, we're average. Cheers. Hello from the swamp in Washington, D.C. Anyway, hope you're all doing marvelously well. We um, so we've, we've made this week a little bit more about production and a little less about mix, mix, mixing. As you know, um, there is 10,000, probably more, 100,000 mixing channels out there. And um, one of the things about mixing is um, the basic principles, the technical principles are quite easy to teach. And I highly recommend if you you know, get, have your own YouTube channels, you know what I mean? I Get out there, because YouTube for you can be a great promotional tool as well. So I highly recommend that if you're all um, producers, engineers and mixers, have your own YouTube channels and, you know, do some, do some um, um, tuition videos. I highly recommend it. In fact, do them and then send me links and I'll go and watch them and like them and comment. Because I think the thing about the mixing is, is that we can all talk about boosting 60 hertz, pulling out somewhere between two to 400 in the low mids of the kick, one, one K for the knocking sound, the one five for a little bit more aggression, two five for like a classic rock sound, seven K and above for metal. I mean, this can all be taught um, and learned quite easily. However, mixing is a lot more than just boosting and cutting frequencies, first of all, and most importantly, Recording is the most important part, you know, and it's the reason why there is very few channels talking about recording because that is a lot harder skill and uh, an art form. And it's especially when recording organic instruments. Um, we're in this blessed world now where there's this revolution in virtual instruments, hence the revolution in all these thousands of mixing channels, because the revolution is, is like you can pretty much open up any DAW and I want to know what DAW you have in a minute that will be one of our things um, you know um, don't worry about Germany Tom we all know Germany is an incredible team um, anyway so um, the um, so the principles you know everybody has a DAW virtual instruments are available pretty much on any DAW now um, I don't believe there is one that doesn't have virtual instruments inside. This is all really, really good. So you can get into the sort of paint by numbers, um, you know, mixing style. But as soon as you stick a mic up on, in some, on something, whether it be an acoustic guitar or a vocal, all bets are off. And we're talking about a whole different way of working. And I think that this is really, really important um, for us to talk about and to think about. 
is like how do we how do we um you know how do we get that conversation going so i really really want to talk about stuff like that now we talked about acoustic guitar miking recently but i think i want to talk more about production i want to talk about more about production in general and just a way to think about recording now last week i had an acoustic guitar this one up here whoopsie which i've just now dented again and I took this acoustic guitar last week and we talked about basic ideas of a production and arrangement. We talked about the fact that, you know, if you had a, a, bo a boring 6415. <laughs> took that we could do and we talked about all the different layering and parts and I did a video you know an off-the-cuff kind of video talking about those kind of things now the thing with production is um, and if you listen to some of the modern rock stuff which I've been listening to a lot because of the band I'm working with the Matthews we've been listening to like bring me the horizon and bands like that and they started off as a really kind of like you know, super heavy kind of kind of band like that. Um, you know, it's sort of like low tuning and stuff. And now recently they have a new band member who is a keyboard player and they've been integrating tons of like, not just dance elements, but incredible keyboard stuff. And what you notice is, especially in things like heavy rock, is like a lot of what used to be like big fat chords is now Tim Pierce does a lot, a lot. He gives the energy and the idea of a big heavy chord, but it's literally one note and maybe like a fifth played over it. That way it gives you the energy of the it gives you the energy of the guitars. You get that kind of sound. But if you've got tons of synth stuff, like you've got keyboard stabs, you've got, you know, like arpeggios. You can still feel it. If I was to put like a wall of guitars either side, suddenly that boodle boodle bada disappears. So this is really, these are 11s going to strings. So these are, um, these these things. So these things are very, very important for us to know, is to think about like with production, because if somebody, it's okay to spend our whole lives on YouTube talking about mixing, which is what every, every nearly every channel does, is talk about mix, 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 it's, there's channels called mix, this, that, this, the mix, mix, the blah, 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 all this stuff. All of these things I totally understand, but a lot of the time it's putting a band-aid on a wound the best way to get these songs to sound good is to record them the way you want to hear it. And if you're a musician working on your own material, then we need to be thinking about these kind of things. Um, okay, so let's do a quick giveaway. I'm gonna give away the two production videos that we did this week, that we showcased, did we? showcased not showcased, did. Uh, one is the Bob Horn, um, you know, the Bob Horn video and uh, with Eric Rikers, where they recorded Little Empire. We filmed it over three days. It was really fantastic. Um, it was done over three days, and we did a mix of it. So you can get that download. You can download that full course. It's over 10 hours. And we also did a, um, a Phil Allen one with Morgan Mallory, which was, I, I think, a really, really great song and a fantastic voice. So for that, all I want you to do is repeat to me, a few of you already did, um, how do you get me to mix your EP? You have to email me. And you do have to afford, be able to afford to pay me. I'm not incredibly expensive, but I'm not cheap. And I'm not free. <laughs> um, because I'm super busy working on many, many projects. Tonight we're doing Ace, we're working with Ace Freely tonight. Uh, we're going to go and work with an artist on a Japanese label in about an hour and 15 minutes. And then in between that, I'm going to be working with Bob Marlette 
and uh, Matthew's boy. So I'm doing three different, three different things today. And I already filmed Feedback Friday for the Academy, and now I'm doing a live thing. So I'm very, very busy. So I don't, I don't work for free because I, I have other paying stuff that I do. And I think that that's kind of what I want to... Thank you, Alex. I'm glad you enjoy those Bob Horn courses. So, all I simply need you to do is actually what a few of you already did. Tell me, what is your DAW? I want to know, what is the DAW, um, what is the DAW that you use? What do you use? Tell me all about it. Thank you ever so much, Tismonis. If you want to buy us lunch today, I'd appreciate it. Um, there's a little, um, there's the little dollar sign at the bottom of the chat, and if you hit that, you can send us money for lunch. We uh, we had lunch on you the other day. I really appreciate it. So, what are you using? Uh, Reaper. Oh, you're going to be in Nashville. Fantastic. Thank you, Loretta. Lots of Cubase, Reaper, Studio One, Logic, lots of Reaper still, Pro Tools. Some great stuff there, Logic, Pro Tools 11, uh, Reaper, Reaper, Pro Tools, Logic. Reaper, Ableton, Audacity, FL Studio. More Logic, Combination Logic and Pro Tools. We do a bit of that too. Ableton, Studio One. Hey, Peter bought us lunch. Thank you ever so much, Peter. I really appreciate it. You rock, my friend. Uh, Mixcraft, Pro Tools. A combination of Mixcraft and Pro Tools. Cakewalk. Cubase, Sonar. Mixbus. Wilma, your chat stopped. We can still see you. Chris Norris, what Chris? What did you use, Chris Norris? What do you? Master tracks. Congrats. Same logic too. So, if you haven't already and you're watching, please subscribe. It'd be amazing if you subscribe, and you do have to hit this notification bell. And believe it or not, now they want you to hit. Now they want you to go in and choose to see the videos after you subscribed and after you've hit the notification bell. Yes, it is true. They, they, they are working as hard these days to make sure that you, you know, if you really want to, you can't just subscribe. You have to make sure that you know, that the whole world knows that you really want to watch this channel. <laughs> anyway, I'm just shredding around here, having some fun playing some guitar. Um, so, to me, it's all about the production side. Um, the mixing side is absolutely phenomenal, and it's great and wonderful. Um, thank you, Tisbonus. You absolutely rock, my friend. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, so, but production is really going to save us a lot of time and energy and make our mixing a lot easier. So let's talk about, do I remember master tracks? I don't off the top of my head. I'm not sure what that is. Maybe I will in a second. Hello there in Brazil. Um, excited to see tomorrow's game with Neymar. Thank you ever so much, David. Uh, oh, right, good. Yeah, the mailing list is pretty good. Yeah, if you're on the mailing list, you'll also get notified of the of the latest videos as well. So anyway, um, so production is something I really, really want us to focus on. Now, live drums have their own set of great advantages and issues, of course. The thing with live drums is you want to inherently make sure you've got a, a, a huge amount of energy in those drums. So sometimes it's as simple as parallel compressing the drums and having an energy track stereo underneath. I have that on the console here when I'm mixing. Um, see how I've got a, a you bet it's, it's blown out by the lighting, but that says drum crush drums. So what it is, is it's the whole drums coming up on fader that's been annihilated. And it's just like, and I bring that up for energy because quite often, um, you know, this is where we have this whole discussion about whether to use samples or not. But it really depends on how the drums are recorded and what you're trying to get. And I'm not going to get into discussion on the purest of this kind of stuff because that is, um, oh, thank you, Andrew. I'm glad you enjoy the noodling. Um, you know, because the reality is, is that we are trying to get great drum energy out of the, out of the, out of all of the, 
um, things we do. So if you've got a drum kit and you've got a great performance, thank you ever so much, William. I really appreciate it. Um, you are buying my burger. So with all that in mind, with all of this in mind, I think it's very, very important to, to understand that it really does come from the production. So the question is, is like, we need to build that song from the ground up. Obviously, number one, if you're working with the artist and you're not just mixing, you need to be sitting in there with them and working on the arrangement of the song. The arrangement is a huge part of it. I heard somebody the other day talking about arrangement stuff, and, and that's great, um, but there is no one-size-fits-all kind of arrangement. There is no right way or wrong way to do it. I think it's really, really important. It's really important for us to make sure that we introduce enough drama and dynamics into all of our mixes so that we can, um, you know, into, uh, into our productions so that we can tell a story. That's absolutely fantastic, but it needs to work from the ground up. I, to me, every part that I put down in a production has to have a reason to exist. This is where I think there's been a big proliferation of mixing conversations because everybody's trying to figure out how to mix the 47 guitar parts and keyboard parts that have been put on a track. What about if we weren't sitting there trying to annihilate and pull apart all of these different things, but we structured our parts better? The other day I talked about, like I was saying earlier, about taking like, you know, maybe this 6415 and doing, you know, maybe I play the F sharp here and do, you know, so got that. So that, the D, you know, here, you know, so. And then I can go to the A here, and then the E. So I've got this. The great thing about that is I can keep it out of the way of those inversions. So think about this, not just on guitar. I'm a guitar player, it's my first instrument. I'm a keyboard player as well, but this is my first instrument, so I'm using it as an example. So think about this in your production. Think very clearly about your voicings and how to unclutter things. You know, if, if this is the chord sequence, That's my chord sequence, the F sharp minor, the D, the A, and the E. Now think about it on other instruments. What I'm doing here immediately is I'm, I've got a totally different voicing to my F sharp minor. So it doesn't matter if you're on a, it doesn't matter if you're on an acoustic guitar or a piano, here's your voicing here. Now play something melodic up here. I'm completely out of the way of these voicings over here. Then I've got a bass guitar, which is going to be one octave lower than this. Maybe then you get a baritone guitar or another key instrument or a synth or something, and you sit it between. So maybe I have a C sharp playing an octave lower than this on another instrument. You see what I'm getting? This is the beauty of the production of like bands like the Beach Boys. This was something that he really did so well. Brian Wilson was able to separate his instruments up so that there was no there wasn't a massive crossover if you've got tons of instruments all playing this you know so basically look at this there's my f sharp minor there root three five root three five root three five so if I just happen to write a whole bunch of guitar parts that are all like, you know, all I'm going to get is this massive build up. Yes, there's different, there's different implications from the different strings being used, which is also important because you want a solidity. Some strings, like if I'm playing a melody like a, so that's my melody. Already sounds tougher there. Might be better there. You know, you've got... So there is definitely with instruments like different, the same voicing but on different strings can be really, can toughen things up. 
but ultimately understanding how to arrange those parts, how to produce those parts so they fit together is going to make your life so much easier to mix. Because one of the biggest things and why you get so much low mid build up and people are talking about that is not necessarily because it's recorded badly. I mean, a lot of the time you may record your acoustic guitar really well, it might be beautiful. However, if there's an acoustic guitar playing this voicing, a piano playing that voicing, and many, many other instruments, you're going to get a lot of low mid build up here. And this, this low mid build up is going to be all over the place because you've got multiple voicings in there. That is where production plays a massive key in everything. It's the most important thing. Fixing it in the mix, yes, you can sit there and I could take my acoustic guitar and wipe out all my low mids entirely, so you're only really hearing this, of course. But what are you really doing? You're putting that band aid on the gaping wound, you're trying to fix everything in the mix, and it becomes a technical thing. Now, so why am I saying this? I'm saying this because there's a lot of criticism about the way modern records sound. Start thinking about this logically. I hope everybody's with me here. Think about this logically. The reason why we love so many of these incredible records when they had a limited amount of tracks was not because they had a limited amount of tracks and we all but specifically, but because because they did have a limited amount of tracks, they had to have they had to figure out how all the all the instruments work together there and then on the fly, because if they were bouncing things together, they were forced to make sure those voicings worked. It's as simple as this. If you listen to early Beatles recordings, they would have bass and tambourine on the same track. Why is that? That's because the bass is like and the tambourine they're completely away from each other. So how do you turn up the tambourine on the bass track? You put more high mids and high end on it and the tambourine gets louder and it barely affects the bass line. How do you turn up the bass on that track without turning up the tambourine? You turn up the low mids and the low end on that track and the tambourine doesn't get any louder but the bass does. You're getting the philosophy here. So the limitation of the tracks, whether it be four or even as much as 24, forced people to think in a way that they made better decisions on their parts that they recorded and the choices that they made. It wasn't that they were geniuses, it was that they were being forced into it. Now, because of the unlimited amount of tracks, we're not making those same decisions. Therefore, this proliferation of thousands and thousands of YouTube channels doing mixing is because everybody's like trying to figure out how do we make our records sound good. We have to make our records sound, how do we make them sound good like the way they used to record? Well, how about getting back to the source? Record them better. And I don't mean record them better like being all snobby. I'm not a snob. I'm not about like, oh, you know, you need a U47 into a, a, a 1073 into a two inch tape machine. That's not what I mean. It's not about that because some of the best records are still re are, uh, that are done are recorded by people using DAWs. Um, so it's not about it's not about like being a snob and thinking you have to throw expensive equipment at it. It's not that at all. A lot of the stuff that we do is done with Lewitt microphones, as you know, and it's done with my 1173. Um, and I think, oh, you know what, Matt? Can you put a link to the 1173, which is a mic pre compressor all in one? It's got a 1073 style mic pre and an 1176 style um, compressor in it. My two favorite things in the world to record, to use on recording. So we designed a box that had all of those components together. Instead of being $5,000 for it, we made it a little over a thousand. And the reason why I did that is because I wanted to prove that with one thing, and maybe one fifty-seven and one like five hundred dollar condenser, you can make the same quality sounding recording as anybody else. It's not in the gear; it's in the ideas and the arrangement and the production. That's what it's in. Okay, so let us before we carry on, let's do another giveaway. Look, there you go. There's the eleven seventy-three. There, thank you, Matt. Um, so let's do another giveaway. Let's do. We're on, we're on the half hour mark here. Maybe we'll get. Maybe we'll get. So we're going to do, give away the two production courses by Phil and Bob. I think I need to do a production course. I really do. 
I think I need to do one because I think this is uh, we we do a lot of we do a lot of online stuff. Uh, but I think I need to do one that we can we can talk about because I think a lot of this stuff we're talking about can be really really good. Well, my thoughts on control services. Thank you. All right, so what have we done? We've talked about your DAWs and what you use. Um, I really want us to focus on production. That's why it's called Produce um, Produce Like a Pro. Uh, sure. What is the What is the question, J. Schneider or G. Schneider? Um, I will pay attention if you ask it. Oh, Andy Jackson told you that. I work with Andy Jackson. That's amazing. I work with Andy Jackson. He's one of mine. Always wanted a channel strip box with preamp compressor and EQ. I didn't put an EQ in this, but we might have one coming soon with an EQ at some point. Um, do you think YouTube will ever change the way people consume music? I mean, they are, they've already have, you know? Yeah, it's all about production. So how, how often should it take breaks between production and track and switching? How long it should be? I think with production, I can work pretty straight through. I can do... Um, I, I, I can I can usually work a 10 or 12 hour a day producing because I get lots of different breaks because I can move between different things. If we're doing guitars and my ears are getting burnt on playing guitars, I would just do something else. I personally, when I'm producing, like producing on my own, not with other people, like to work very, very fast and keep the creativity moving and not get too bogged down. But I've been engineering for a long time, so I know when something sounds good, so I don't have to spend that sort of three hours tweaking things, you know what I mean? Hey, Jeff McDonald. Yeah, Jeff is saying, you know, has editing affected stuff by per by perfection um, improve, uh, uh, replacing feel? I think so, I think that's certain thing. I don't think it's as big of a problem, one of the, um, is it like the real thing? Yes, it is, JS. I, this is a good question. So. And I, I'm, I'm not harping back to the old days because the thing is, is like that those days have gone. There's very, very few great studios left compared with what there was. And the ones that are left are, are expensive for obvious reasons. They're, it's real estate. You know what I mean? There's a lot. You know, I, I was in Sunset Sound Studio One with uh, Daryl um, two days ago and it was wonderful. And I highly recommend that video when it comes out. Check it out. Um, I was in that studio and it was a, it was one of my favorite studios in the world. Um, and it's a lot of real estate. So they got to charge a certain amount of money for it. I mean, what are they going to do? They've got to pay the taxes and all this kind of stuff. So there's a very there's only a handful of those incredible studios left. And when you go to those rooms, you need to utilize them for what they're good at. And what they're good at is getting a whole bunch of guys and girls sitting in a room together performing at the same time. That's what they're good at. That is their strongest part. You know, it's it makes it absolutely wonderful that you can all be together and, you know, perform together. So the strength of tape was, you know, there was a lot of, there's a lot of BS about tape. I have a tape machine. I've used tape my whole life. That's one of my favorite tape machines. It's an A80. It's a Mark II. It's built in 1978. It sounds phenomenal. But the thing about tape was not so much about it sonically. Yes, it has a certain sound, but you know, you can use so many great emulations these days and reproduce that sound. The thing about tape wasn't the sound. I know everybody's going to disagree with me. It was about the mindset. The mindset of tape is that you all were in the live room, you were playing together, you were performing together, and then you came back into the control room and they played back through the speakers and you went and said, oh, as a bass player, I used to go, oh, I'm on top of the drums. I need to lay back. I need to push harder into this chorus. You know, um, the vocalist needs to do this, that, and that. The point is, is like everybody listened to each other. They were forced to listen to each other. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of my favorite records were made independently. Tracking drums, overdubbing basses. It's, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jay, uh, G. Snyder. I thank, I really appreciate it. So the, um, I just think you brought another person lunch. Thank you ever so much. So 
don't get me wrong. It was really, really important. I think it's really, really important to um, to have that philosophy that you will work off each other and you make great feeling records. However, there are, like I said, plenty of records made that were not gridded necessarily, but really chopped together, even on tape and put together. And they spent hours and hours doing that. Listen to um, listen to a night of the opera. It's my favorite record. It's a freaking masterpiece. There is no way that was one take and it off it went. They took, I think, nine months or a year to make that album. And it's one of the greatest sounding albums. And there's tons of overdubs and fixes and all the stuff that people did to make it absolutely amazing. So that's what it's always been done. It's just about the mentality. If you do listen to a night of the opera, which I highly, highly. Um, I can't see your question, though, Jay. Can you put Jay Schneider? Just ask me again like and I'll uh, and I will answer it. It's so many thousands of questions have come here. You need to ask it so I can see it. I, I, I don't I wouldn't know where to scroll back, scroll back and read it. Um, we've got so many things. So please just ask it again and I'll answer it. Um, so um, so basically, it's really important. It's, it's really important to not not get caught up in the sound of tape, not get caught up into like all about performance and feel. Those are all important things. They're all important. The most important thing is how those guys and girls arranged and built their tracks. If you listen to A Night of the Opera, it's very clearly delineated. Every instrument has its place. Brian May was using uh, the treble booster. He was using the DC amp, the John Deacon's design amp, which was this small little speaker. It was a hi-fi. It was a, a, a little hi-fi speaker with a little radio, like a radio in it. To, for the amp and it had this narrow mid rangey sound which got out of the way of the bass guitar got out of the way of the piano and cut hello terry uh yeah please resend um, i'm waiting for you to resend it send it uh, so um uh, so you understand my point is like those were very well arranged very well produced songs so think about whether it's guitar whether it's keyboards, whether it's strings, think about the voicings. And if you've got a ton of low mids and high mids fighting each other in the mix, then start thinking about what are the parts that you're going to use to separate those instruments. And what instruments are you going to use that maybe have more specific bands? Like the last thing you want to do is, um, I agree, Loretta, um, the last thing you want to do is have a multitude of instruments all playing in the same place. So like I was saying with guitar, and I'm just using an acoustic guitar for a, a reference, you know, simply put, all right, here's your question, Jay, let's answer it. A friend is doing a short but big melodic guitar solo for me and sending it back. First line of, uh, first line of tips on that, mixing wise, thickening, etc. He's only sending one stereo file. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to answer um, uh, G. Snyder's uh question here because he's been trying to ask or they've been trying to ask it yes if they're sending you a stereo file does that mean it's covered with effects that could be really really good however if his effects don't work in your mix you might be a little you know that might not work so what i would ask for in this instance i think to help you out is ask ask them to send you a dry unaffected version you know distorted whatever but then, but also send you an affected version. Or if you want to get really pedantic to blend into your mix properly, get the dry version and the effects separated so you can blend them as you want. Without hearing your mix and without hearing their parts, I can't guarantee, you know, what's the best solution. But I do know if you had a separate dry, like just rock. If that was like the solo and you had the, the effects separated, you definitely could be able to mix it the way you want it to be. You know, I think it's all about, but it might just work amazingly. Like if Tim Pierce sent me a stereo file of a guitar solo with an effects on, he's got an amazing ear. He'll have used the right amount of effects to blend into my mix. That's just what he does. But, um, you know, but I think it's very, very important. It's very, very important that you have the option to blend it the way you want it to be. Hopefully that answers the question for you. Okay, so getting back to what we were talking about. So yes, production is all about finding the right parts, the right arrangement of the way things to work together. Then you're not going to be spending hours trying to 
spent look online on all of the thousands of different you know um, competing mixing channels trying to figure out how to mix things because they're going to come up the way you want them to hear them and there's this implication i think because engineers not producers and not musicians talk a lot if you're not a musician this is where it gets a little squirrely and again you don't have to be a musician but it helps if you're a musician you can talk and think about parts you can like i said you can get the f sharp <laughs> And you can do another voicing, you know what I mean? You could, you could do the voicing, you know, here and here and know that they're all getting out of the way of each other. Now, if you're an engineer, your, your job is to EQ things and make them fit together. So if, the, if one guitar player is going and the other one's going, we've got that same C sharp, F sharp, you know. of each other and they're competing with each other and then suddenly there's this massive low low mid build up so that's where being a musician can help that's where being a producer that's where the producer's job comes in where it gets stuck in there and works on the parts with people then when you come to mix you don't have a bass player maybe playing a high f sharp hitting that same low f sharp that you've got on the guitar being reinforced or the c sharp. the point is is like you're going to get these build up of all these things that's where you start going, oh, there's too many low mids in my mix. There's not too many low mids in your mix because of the way it was recorded. There's too many low mids in the way that it was arranged, the way it was produced. So this is where we really need to start like focusing on proper recording. And proper recording, again, is not talking about EQ and compression. It's talking about getting the right voicings and thinking about how things slot together. This is why I highly recommend listening to albums like Pet Sounds. You know, because you can hear... I just keep thinking of that, keep thinking of that um, Portlandia video. You know, these are the keys that they used on Pet Sounds. Anyway, does anybody, have anybody seen that one? It's hilarious. Okay, so. Told him many times he's wrong, but he's too stubborn. What's this, Vilma? Whoever he used nine may have said 40,000 in gear or something and he's giving DAW credit. I don't know who you guys are talking about. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Who, I'm not sure who you're talking about, so I can't really comment. There's a whole other conversation going on here. Uh, anyway, I hope I answered your uh, um, question, G. Snyder. So, yeah, to me, production is where it is at. Um, but hello there, Ryan. Good to see you. All right, so... Let us, let us, uh, let us talk, let's do another giveaway. Okay, so we've done what DAW use. I want to know a little bit more about it. Um, do you play an instrument? So this is the question. Do you play which, to win the next giveaway? Do you play an instrument? So question number one. And if so, what instrument do you play? I want to know a bit more about you. Um, I want to know a little bit more about you. So um, tell me if you do play an instrument um, and then what instrument it is that you play. Okay, what, do you play an instrument? So you can say, yes, I play guitar or no, I don't play an instrument. Everybody is able to enter this. So please stay here, keep watching. Hello, Bob. Oh, and if you sing, that's fine. Yes, if you're a singer, please tell us that as well. Guitar, bass, drums, mostly guitar. Piano, guitar, piano, guitar, bass, lots of guitars, guitar, lots of keys, guitars. It's great, there's so many guitar players here, this is fantastic. Learning keys, great, lots of drums, singing. Guitar, drums, keys. Terry plays a lot of stuff. Saxophone. Triangle, nice answer. Guitar. Triangle, mandolin. Singer. Lots of keys, lots more guitars. Drummer and kungas. The list, you play lots of things. Bass predominantly. Voice, 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 voice. 
Uh, you just won. Oh, congratulations, Martine or Martine. I'm not sure. I have so many different friends called like Martin or Martine. Or... I don't want to mess up the pronunciation. What do you play? Uh, Martin or Martine. What do you play? What instrument? Please let us know. Congratulations for winning. And what do you play? Um, so I play the full. Yes, AJ. I play the full all the time. <laughs> Mandolin, ukulele. Oh, I don't play any brass or woodwind as well. That's that's a great delineation. I. Congratulations. You play superior drummer, Ryan. You play with the spirit. You play with spirit. And a Yamaha acoustic. Well. East Sussex. Thank you, George. I don't know if my hands are that big, but some people have said that. I do have a crazy stretch on my left hand from playing for all these years. My, my, my stretch between my two hands, can you see that? This is my left. So if I stretch it as far as I can, see how much bigger my left hand stretches? It's pretty nuts. That's just from playing. You see how much bigger? This is my left hand here. See how much, it's insane. It's about, you know, I've got this finger here is like an inch further and my thumb is like two in, three inches further. So I've got a much bigger stretch. That's just from my left hand from playing guitar. Um, so, you know, when I was a kid, I used to play six to eight hours a day when I was a teenager. Big hands, big gloves, yeah. Yes, who, who is, who's at work watching at the moment? Anyway, so let's get back to it. So production really is what we need to be focusing on. Let's, um, you know, how often do I use different tunings? I like different tunings for writing. Um, for electronic music, 96K, that's a tough one. I think if I'm using 99% virtual instruments, I don't know if you have to use 96K. There's no harm in using it. You know what I mean? All these people, you're all at work? Nice. Called in sick, Barry. Just left the office. Not me. Barely working. That was that song Bleed that I did. That Not much of a voice going on. Hey Scott, um, how much should one snap to groove for backup vocals and how much is too much? I think, um, okay, so great, great question because now we can talk a bit more about production. I love the inspiration. Now with backgrounds, um, I'm, like I said, I'm doing, the, I'm doing several albums at the moment, I'm trying to finish Dustin Thomas's, we've got Christina Holmes coming in, we've got a new artist coming in in two weeks. Um, we're going to be in Nashville next week producing and doing a masterclass with uh, Steve. For those of you that are going to the masterclass next week, we have Steve Magora coming in. It's going to be phenomenal. Um, so that you'll, you'll really, really enjoy that. I think that, um, I think that it's important to think about the background stuff there because there's so much music now which is using incredibly layered background parts. And... With the, um, with the Matthews album, um, we have a phenomenal singer. Uh, Jack is an incredible singer. And we want to go for a lot of layered harmony parts. We really, really want to work on that. Really super hard. And um, it's going to be really important for me to get that. Hey, Anne. Um, and um, I, it's really, really important to do that. Um, so what I want to be able to do and to talk about is there's quick, easy solutions to this stuff, but then there's great sounding things. Now, what I did is I listened to multi-tracks of 
lots of bands that are freely available as you know you can get multi tracks and I listened I listened to the end result of a mix and I said what do I love the sound of and I love the sound of Queen backgrounds and I love the sound of a few modern bands one of which is bring me the horizon um, I like the way their background sounded and then when I listened to the multi tracks of these bands I realized that none of them obviously Queen couldn't back in the day and bring me the horizon weren't using any kind of vocal aligning techniques they if they were doing vocal align it was just on small pieces and they weren't tuning the schnizzle out of it they may have been tuning on bring me the horizon all bands do tune here and there but you could hear that they were going primarily and predominantly for takes they were going for takes now what does that mean that means that it just sounds bigger everything about it sounds bigger and better because um, because the way the stuff was layered together just interacts really really well because you'll get like maybe the end of a phrase like I'm da da there's a vibrato in it now if you match that vibrato inside a vocal align which you can do with a vocal line plugin don't get me wrong vocal line is amazing it's a great plugin if you match that waveform it just ends up sounding like a robot sung it but if you sing against it and you get two different vibratos just moving together, you get this beautiful, wide, larger than life sound. So when you're talking about snapping to grid or editing background vocals, yes, of course, if you have to and you're not working with the singer and you're being asked to mix something and it's sloppy and messy and just like a big sloppy, messy, whatever, and you just want that to be so much tighter but you don't want it to be so tight that it just sounds like a robot. You need to get that to, you want it to feel really good. You want it to sound larger than life. So the best way to do that, frankly, is to do it at the production stage. Is to sit there and just keep doing a take until it feels good. And then when it feels good, do another take and double that. And do another take and double that. Now, the reason why I say that is because it was easy for bands like Queen because they rehearse together and they work together. It's not, thank you, Ryan, I'll, um, I'll get to that in a second. So I just want to finish this, this background conversation. The reality is, is when you do that, when you do these kind of things where you get stuff to interact together in a natural way, it will always, always sound bigger and you want it to sound huge. There might be times where you don't want it to sound huge and you might want the robot voice, but Everything I've been doing on research wise has led me to believe that for the album I'm making, if I want that huge background sound, I've just got to do it in performances. And yes, I'm not saying that I won't nudge things around. And as you know, with Def Leppard and Queen, they were very famous for taking the lead vocal and gating the background vocals to it, which is a technique I would still try. Do you know what I mean? So if you've got that, is this the real life? Is this just fantasy? If you've got that kind of feeling like that, you can have the lead vocal, is this the real life? Gate shuts off. So it's side chaining. The lead vocal is side chaining the gate to the background. It's a nice effect. And it's not quite as exacting as vocal align, but it creates an interesting kind of chopped sound. It's a little bit like the, the Tony Visconti, David Bowie trick where Bowie's singing in a room on a mic and then there's another mic a little further back in the same room and the lead vocal gates that second mic. So you've got that, I don't know, and you've got, no! And it's got this sound of a larger room that stops with the vocal and it gives the vocal a larger sound. It's also like the distorted vocal trick that we do, the lo-fi distorted effect and the, and the octave. You make sure that they don't ever work longer than the lead vocal, therefore they add to the lead vocal. They make that lead vocal just feel larger than life. Okay, let's go and answer Ryan's question. I just wanted to fin finish that other question. Uh, just acquired an old Allen, Allen Heath GS1 analog mixer. Love that mixer. Does it have a place in the home studio? Any tips on integrating to my workflow? Yes, yes, and yes. I am a big fan of these mid price consoles from the um, like 80s and 90s. Yes, I agree, Tony. Queen are a great example of vocal recording. Um, the Yes, I agree 
a low mid priced GS1, GS2 um, soundtracks consoles from the 80s and 90s. I mean, these consoles were like not cheap, but they were cheap compared with Neves and SSLs. And some of them are chip based, um, some of them have transformers, some of them have op amps. You know, um, for instance, in America, Quad is, is, is becoming a little bit of a, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's, they, they, they've become like a, they have op amps in them, but they've become very popular. And I think that we, the, the thing is, I used to have an, um, a TAC Scorpion, which is a cheap, inexpensive Amec, and you can pick those up, Amec, you can pick those up for 715 DDA consoles, DDA, Amex, um, you know, tax, um, you know, these consoles can be picked up for $1,500 or less. And what they give you is 16, 24, 32 or 40 channels of really good sounding unique pre's. Oh, you got it for free. Well, that's fantastic, right? I mean, basically, I, I, I really believe that that is a great investment. They've got a little dirt in them, a little wrongness. They've got some color in those EQs. I mean, to me, it's like a great investment. And the other thing that's great about them is let's just say you've only got a two, a four, a six, or an eight input, uh, you know, an, an eight input I.O. You can sum your toms. Let's say you want to double mic your toms. Think about it. You've only got an eight input, but you've got a 16 or 24 channel, inexpensive um, GS1, GS2, you know, Alan Heath, soundtracks, um, you know, People are buying Midas consoles now for touring and using them. So what you can do is that like you can sit there and you can go, well, look, here's my toms, you know, top and bottom, and sum them. You could take three overheads and sum them to two. You could take, you know, you could take multiple mics and now sum them inside of the console because you've only got an eight input I.O. It's, so I think they are a marvelous investment. And I think that, uh, yeah, DDA was a great console. Um... You know, so I think that you, uh, that's such a great song, Barry. I don't know the actual recording on that. I've got to find out. I want to interview guys involved in Queen so badly. Um, so, yes, I think you made a great investment. And I highly recommend that. I think for, I, I think it's a great way, um, it's a great way to, to sum stuff inside of a console. Think about, you know, um, front and back miking of a, of a guitar cab, for instance. You know, if you want to do that, you can flip the phase on the back one. So I do actually think buying one of these Alan Heath soundtracks, um, you know, Soundcraft consoles from the 80s or 90s is a very smart idea because they were making really, really good stuff. They were competing against more expensive things. And you can get them so inexpensively, Tax Scorpions, DDAs, that they are really, really good. I don't have any specific videos on sound design, but I do sound design a lot in, in my videos. Um, somebody's saying, how much would you charge for your work? You really, when you, at this stage where you're at, you need to find out about your client. How much are they willing to pay? I mean, it's sort of, you need to fish a little bit because you, if you have a one size fits all price for everything, you won't work. You need to work with your client. I only charge one thing and that's my time. If something's going to take me 20 hours, it's more expensive than something that takes me five hours. That's what I get charged for. Yeah. It's all about time. How much is my time? Um, okay, so last but no means leave. least, we have one more giveaway. What should we do for our last giveaway? We have done DAWs. We have done whether you're a musician and what you play. Oh, here's one more. Let's find out a little bit more. Um, and you could, don't have to say yes, you can just say no, and, or say you're a budding one. Are you songwriters? Are you all songwriters? Do you write songs? And that can be anything from building tracks to, you know, sitting down with an acoustic guitar and writing lyrics. Are you songwriters? Tell me, tell us a little bit about, more about yourself. I want to know... Yes, Mark is a songwriter. Lots of songwriters. Mime is money, yeah. Mime is money. Frame Junkie, yes. Jason. 
What happened to the Ennis Tens? They went years ago. Tony who says he writes songs every day. Great. Not a writer. That's okay. Trying to be. Definitely. I love songwriting. So we have a lot of songwriters, a lot of instrumentalists, a lot of people that play, play and uh, arranger or composer. Great. Instrumentals is fine. Congrats. Oh, AJ, what a prize. Yay, AJ. That's great. This is where AJ says, I've already bought those. <laughs> writing melodies is just songwriting. Writing lyrics is songwriting. You don't have to do it all. There are some writers that are only lyricists. There are some writers that are only melody people. There are some writers that only do chords. It really depends. I mean, I, I like to do the whole thing. But there's lots of people. Hey, hey, hey. Three, three years of being in the Academy. Nice. 192 songs. And AJ's like, I've been here for three years and I finally won something. <laughs> you know, Matt does these at random, so... Can I play La Bamba? Uh, I don't remember how it goes. Oh no, I'm sorry. Da, 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 ba, 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 da, ba, I've got a Mexican sitting over here. What is it? What is it? Is it? <laughs> da, 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 da. Wherever it goes, <coughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, isn't it? Uh, isn't it a triplet? Boom, ba da dum da dum da boom ba dum boom. You got me. Something as obvious and as easy as that, busted. I can play it if I could go and listen to it quickly. I'd be able to play it back, but because I don't remember how it goes exactly, yeah. Uh, so. Sounds like it should be an F, but so instead of F, I thought it was an I thought thought the uh, yeah I thought it was a G7. Uh, I thought it was an F. Stanford says C F G7. Oh, yep. Yeah. So you're all right. Oh yeah, if I play that, I'll get blocked. <laughs> That's oh. right. That's what happened the other day. I played a song and I got and we and we got a copyright thing saying that, you know, yeah, exactly. If I play any real songs, like now I'm going to get the, uh, you did La Bamba and uh, uh, Universal Music uh, is going to claim it. Um, oh, Neil Diamond, I love um, taking requests now. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> F first first position, not a bar. So no bar. What do you mean, like this? Do sing this F over the C. Da, 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 da. Really? Da, 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 da. So it is over the C. All right. Okay. I trust you. It just uh, yeah. Okay. So apparently it is the. Uh, yes, I know. I've heard about that. All right. Yeah, Twist and Shout and La Bamba are very very similar. Yeah. You're you're correct. We used to do that years ago in a in a. Uh... <laughs> No, it's funny, Anne. You got me there on that one. All right. Forever in blue jeans. I love that. Love that stuff. F first position, G7. Okay. I understand what you mean. How do you copyright a 145 song? I don't know. People do. Yeah, I know. The YouTube one. You were baited. Ah, it's quite fine. It's funny. Okay. So um, let us, uh, I'm going to sign off in a second. I just want to say thank you ever so much. If you haven't already, you're being educated, good. 
If you haven't already, please like and share. Um, I am now looking on my YouTube here. I actually haven't looked at YouTube since we started. Um, let's have a quick look. There's 301 people watching. Thank you ever so much for watching. That's so amazing. And I have 173 likes. Could you please like and share? I really, really appreciate it. That would be absolutely amazing. It'd be fantastic. The acoustic is going to fall. No, it's, uh, it's on the strings, but thank you for... Uh, Thanks for pointing it out. Uh, so please like and share. Thank you ever so much, everybody. It's been absolutely wonderful. And sorry, Anne, that I couldn't immediately remember how to play La Bamba. It's it's terrible. If I don't if I don't know, hear the song in my head, I can't play. If I can hear a song, I can. I just remember that. Da 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 da. And that was it. <laughs> do I ever use my thumb over? No, I just use the thumb. I do on bends. I'll do. I don't do this, if that's what you're asking about, but I will go. I'll go straight hand for the fast stuff. Just because you get a better reach. You know, so I'll do that for the better reach. So, yes, but the thumb never over, but it will go here, see, for the bend. So please like and share. Thank you ever so much. Thank you to everybody that won the courses. I really want this to make a focus about production here because it's there's so much focus on, uh, of course, on um, mixing which is great but you know let's try not to um, let's try not to spend all of our time specifically focusing on um, you know for, uh, for E for G sharp in the bass F sharp in the bass um, really let me have a look you're getting me here I do the F sharp in the bass like this like that So even if I was to do G-sharp in the bass. You know, I could do the E like that. So is that what you're talking about? G-sharp in the bass on the E. And then F-sharp in the bass. No, I don't use the thumb, thumb for either of those chords. time recording and mixing everybody thank you for all the great questions thank you for everything i am going to hit the road and uh, we're going to go and do some more work it is 11 37 it's been a wonderful hour thank you ever so much please like and share we have to do that and i have to ask for that because unfortunately it's the wonderful world of youtube and uh, yes um oh sunset sound um yes we had a great time summer nam we're going to be at summer nam and uh, um, if you go, it, please come to Summon Am and hang out and see us. We're doing a three-day masterclass at um, Blackbird from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. There's lots of people watching here that are going to be at it. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. On Saturday at Vintage King, Saturday at Vintage King, we're doing a panel. It's going to be Reed Shippham's going to be there. Ryan Hewitt's going to be there. It's going to be amazing. Please check that out. Thank you, everybody. It's been absolutely wonderful. I really appreciate it. So, yes, please come to Summer Nam and come and say hi at the VK um, at VK on Saturday. It'd be lovely to see you. It's at 3 p.m. It's going to be a wonderful time. We're also doing, um, we're doing Produce Like a Pro Congress on Saturday morning for those of you that are going to be in town. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to have an amazing time. I hope to see you at Summer Nam and... Uh, you know, I've been going now, I think this is our third or fourth year of going. 
and we love it, absolutely love it, and we spend the whole time there, it's really wonderful. Have a marvellous time recording and mixing, and I'll see you all again very, very soon.